Venomous Duck Media presents Gareth and the Lost Island Episode 7 The Jungles of Chimia Part 1 Disclaimer This audio drama should be considered rated PG-13 for discussions of sexual hijinks, drinking, consuming questionable potions, brief moments of violence, crude language, and even cruder humour. Please use caution when listening in public, as this story may cause audible laughter. Venomous Duck Media is not liable for any strained abdominal muscles you may receive while listening, or the strange looks you might get from other commuters. If laughter persists for more than four hours, seek immediate medical attention. Good morning, Trollus. Henry? (laughs) Morning. Good morning to you, too. I'm glad you decided to forego the teaching jacket like I did. It's damn hot here in Chimia. Yeah. As Henry says, it's as humid as a chim's crotch in trousers. I keep telling you, kilts are the proper bottoms for men. What did he say? He was just extolling the virtues of kilts. Again. Personally, I won't be switching anytime soon. The boys are drooping so much in this heat, my trousers are the only thing keeping me from stepping on them. That's an image I could have gone without. Although, that would explain those weird tracks we saw in the dunes of the feckin' Hoot Desert last year. Oh, I'm sorry, Trollness. I hope I didn't offend you by talking about that desert. No, I'm not offended. Why would I be? Something you want to share, Gareth? (laughs) Sorry. In the School of Languages, the naming of that desert is used as an example of why you should always double-check your sources, and that most humans are too lazy to do so. Izzy, tell Trollness why you thought he would be offended. The guide on the trip said the desert was taboo to the dwarves, so they named it after the dwarvish phrase for taboo, feckin' hoot. What? That's not the word at all. Come to think of it, I'm not really sure we have one. When the human settlers got to that area, they found the dwarves already living under the mountains. The humans asked the dwarves if they could tell them about the large desert to the west of them. The dwarves told them that they couldn't really say, since they never ventured more than a short way into it. When asked why they didn't, the dwarf they were speaking with, who had a rather thick dwarfish brogue, replied, Because it's fucking hoot! That's why! That misunderstanding led directly to another one. The early human language scholars thought that dwarves would avoid talking about taboo subjects by saying, Each to their own, I suppose. I know I'll regret asking this, but why did they think that? The early scholars replaced taboo with feckin' hoot when talking with dwarves. An example being, buggering sheep is feckin' hoot in our culture. To which the dwarves always replied, Each to their own, I suppose. I was right. I regret asking. (laughs) I thought Izzy was coming with us. Captain, since you're wearing cotton trousers and a linen shirt instead of your usual leathers, I'm guessing you're switching places with Izzy on this foray. (laughs) What happened, Izzy? Big sister ground you? Actually, yes. That's exactly what happened. We may be part owners in the glorious dawn, but I am still her captain. I reserve the right to select which of my crew participates in away teams. Now step back so I can open the railing and toss the rope ladder over. And so, who wants to go first? Trollness, Captain, I wouldn't look at Henry the way you are. He considers the whole Jim's love to climb thing as a racist stereotype. Damn right. To keep the peace, I'll go first. When I get to the bottom, I'll tie off the ladder to make it easier for the rest of you. 
Okay, you can come down now. It's a shock. What was that, Gareth? Oh, oh, it's a Rojas word that translates into atheist word to replace taking religious messiah's name in vain. Considering the size of that monster, I thought it was appropriate. Hmm. If you think that wee bug was big, wait until you see a monkeyto. Think mosquito, but ramped up to the size of a robin. A swarm of those bastards can drain every drop of blood in a person in less than a minute. What were you saying earlier about mixing up a bug repellent? Henry, turn around so I can get into the backpack. Here they are, one for each of us. All you need to do is rub a liberal amount of the elixir onto any exposed skin. Ew! Ugh. I know, it smells a little off, but to a bug, this stuff reeks like pure poison. Cronus, do all of your potions come in nauseating colors? Yes. Now quit whining and put it on. I don't want to have to treat any of you for blood loss, now or any time in the future. We're finally at the coordinates from the second tablet. And while it's not a pyramid, I'm guessing that stone arch with the ramp leading underground is what we're looking for. Hey, I know. Let's have the dwarf go first into the mine. <laughs> Don't bother to translate that. I'm pretty sure it was just as racist as saying a chim likes to climb. I'll go first again. It's my quest that has led us here after all. Just give me a moment to align the light rooms on this tube. Here we go! Odd. Some of this stonework looks dwarvish. Be careful, everyone. My ancestors were a paranoid lot. There's likely to be all sorts of traps down here. Hey, look! It's an Issy and 50 gelt piece! <gasps> what? Do I have something on my clothes? Did... Did he just avoid being cut in half by bending over to pick up a coin? Uh -huh. Huh? Should we tell him how close to death he just came? No. He would never believe us anyway. Gareth, lad. How about I take over going first and look for those traps I mentioned? And that's another trap. What was that? 25 or 30 that we found? I've lost count, but I'm willing to bet we only have one more to go in this tunnel. What makes you think there's only one trap left? The tunnel ends just ahead of us, and the floor is solid stone between us and the doors blocking the way. I'm confident the last trap is set into the door themselves. We dwarves have always enjoyed seeing how the traps built into doors dispatch intruders too much to spoil things by setting any traps right in front of them. Okay then, no touching the doors. That goes double for you, Professor. Can I at least get closer so I can see if there's some kind of clue written on them? Fine, but look with your eyes, not your hands. Fine. No touching! Yeah, I heard you the first time. No touchy touchy! I get it. Huh. Okay. I don't get it. What don't you get? Each door has nine panels on them, with each panel depicting a person doing some everyday task. The only writing is in that ancient language. It reads, the key to open this door lies in the center of cooperation. Well, this sucks sweaty centaur balls. I hate riddles. From your confused expression, I'll assume you haven't had that particular experience. Trust me, they smell and taste awful when sweaty. Professor, please say anything to get that image out of my head. Yeah, um, the pictures on the panels must have something to do with the riddle. Uh, let's see if there's anything the two center panels have in common 
Or maybe there's something in the center of each panel that opens the doors. While you do that, I'll check the tunnel walls. Sometimes my people set up secret entrances and leave a door that goes nowhere just to screw with people. Good idea, Trollis. Thanks. Uh, Captain? Henry? Help me look over the doors again. Gareth, I think I may have found something. But what it means, or if it has anything to do with the panels, I'm not sure. What did you find? I found three identical stones. Not similar, but identical. The first one is here on the wall close to the ground. The second one is on the opposite wall about shoulder height for a human. The third one is in the ceiling just in front of that air shaft. Huh. Maybe the placement of the stones means something in relation to the center panels. The one on the right shows a young woman picking fruit in an orchard. The other one shows a chef in a kitchen. <laughs> I get it now. The answer is food. Okay, you've gone and lost me. Both center panels each deal with food. The room for food looks like a person standing up straight next to a person on their hands and knees, with a third person standing on the second person's back. If I get down on all fours, I can press the lowest stone. Elizabeth can stand on my back and press the stone in the ceiling. If Henry stretches, he can reach up and press the last stone. Henry, has Gareth always been strangers with common sense? <sighs> Doctor, you get the bottom one, I'll get the shoulder height one, and Henry, grab hold of the ledge on their shaft and get the last stone. That way no one has to stand on anybody's back. Uh, yep, yeah, that works too, I suppose. There's another altar, just like the one in the underwater temple. And it looks like there's a clay tablet on top of it. At least it doesn't look like there are any skeletons we have to fight. Now what? Gareth, what have I told you about tempting fate? Don't do it. Exactly. Henry, hand me my family's warhammer. You might want to get your frying pan, Mr. Smashy, ready. Yes, sir. <laughs> Mr. Smashy and the Nutcracker, coming right up. Oh, there they are. The skeletons were just each hiding behind one of the six hidden doors sliding to the ground. That last one's a bit weird, though. I always thought skeletons were people, but that one's some kind of huge cat. Amazing! That's the skeleton of a northern saber cat. They've been extinct since the second great apocalypse. No one has ever found a complete skeleton of one of them before. What? I'm an amateur paleontologist. I'm very happy for you. Any suggestions on how to handle a cat that's only slightly smaller than a pony? Depends. Anyone happen to have a bloody huge ball of yarn with them? Wonderful. I'm going to be killed next to a comedian. Hopefully the professor's little black stick will be as effective on these skeletons as the last ones. That's the cue for you to pull that toy of yours out of the holster you made for it? I'm trying to... But it's stuck! Idiot! Bad kitty! <laughs> it's moving! Almost got it! Whoa. Whoops! Got it! Which of you bastards did that to my son? Why are you skeletons pointing at Henry? I see. You're saying he's next. Not bloody likely. I'm going to- ah! Damn it, cat. Leave me be. Okay, Liz. Remember all those old timers you hung around with as a kid said the best way to deal with the undead is to stop the brain from communicating with the rest of the body. I know these skeletons technically don't have brains, but it should work the same, shouldn't it? 
Oh, come on. That's dragon shit. I shot you. You should be dead. Well, er, even more dead than you already are, I guess. Is there even a word to describe that state? Since you're shrugging your moldy shoulders, I'm guessing you don't know either. Wait, what are you doing? Are you picking your nose? You are, aren't you? Don't you know it's impolite to pick your nose in public? Besides, you don't even have one anymore. Never mind. If I had a bullet lodged in my sinuses, I would pick my nose too. Here, let me holster my pistol. And we can shake to show there's no hard feelings. For the record, I never said anything about not punching while we shook hands. Just like I never said I wouldn't stomp on your soon-to-be-deader-than-already-dead skull rolling around the floor. Still got it. <laughs> okay, let's try this again. That skeleton fighting with Henry isn't paying attention. This time, lame for that weird purple rune on the back of its skull. Oh yeah! Who's your mommy? Who's your mommy? Why is everyone staring at me? Can we just all pretend I never said that? Anyway, Henry, Doctor, break the purple rune on their skulls. It must be what keeps them together. Sure, why not? <laughs> Who's your monkey? Who's your monkey? <sighs> Knocking them into the altar works too. <laughs> Henry, one of them snuck past you and is headed towards Gareth. <laughs> is that all of them? I think so. Oh, my head. what I miss? Thanks for the headache potion, Trollness. Think nothing of it, lad. I'm just glad you weren't hurt worse. Let me know if you get dizzy again, or have sudden loss of vision. Well, I'm not having a problem with my eyes, but there's a weird buzzing in my ears that keeps getting louder. Buzzing? Oh, shite. Monquitos, run! I thought you said they were the size of robins. These things are the size of pigeons. We seem to have discovered a new species. If we live through this, I'll see about naming them after you. Okay, here are the four, and divide by the sign of... What are you babbling about? I'm trying to do complex magical calculations in my head while running. You three keep going. I'll buy us some time. Don't stop running, Gareth. The lawyers... I mean, blood-sucking bastards are almost on top of you. Unholy winds. Oh, yeah, not going to finish that phrase. Run faster, you two. Trust me when I tell you that you don't want to be caught up in the magic blast Gareth is going to unleash. To Shenish. little green tail lemur's about to be pounced on by that tree cat. <laughs> Oops. I forgot to factor in all the animals surrounding me. Again. And there's a lot of animals in our rainforest. You gotta get out of here. I think we can slow down now. That cloud. There's noises. No man should have that power. Why are you stopping, Henry? 
We have to get back to the ship and get out of this accursed jungle. Um, it should be right here. I remember that tree. He says he swears this is where we came to ground. He remembers us climbing down that tree uh, over there. Obviously, you got turned around somewhere and managed to get us lost, Henry. I don't think so. And why do you say that, Doctor? This rope ladder hasn't been here long enough for the jungle to start affecting it. Achoo! Blast it all! I was hoping the elixir I took to control my allergies would have lasted longer. Achoo! Achoo! Let me see that. Ew. I don't want to touch it. I just want to look at it. That's our ladder, all right. Son of a sheep buggering bastard! Where's my airship? Henry, take this spyglass and climb up to the tree canopy. See if you can find any trace of the glorious dawn. I do it myself, but we dwarves are lousy climbers. <laughs> You'd look like the weirdest squirrel ever. <laughs> he says that's probably true, but it would be funny as hell to watch you try. Ha, ha. Don't quit your day job, which might have remind you happens to be working for me. <laughs> Up. <laughs> we might as well have a seat against this tree while we wait. Sounds wonderful. This heat and humidity is making me sleepy. Achoo! Sorry. <sighs> hey, Sneezy. Why so happy? You have a dopey smile on your face. Sometimes when I get sleepy, right before I drift off to slumberland, my memories drift back to the time right after I graduated from medical school. Achoo! Six other dwarves from my village and I got together to form a communal septet. We were young and full of the experimenting spirit. Achoo. You never told me about that. What happened? Why'd you leave? Did they kick you out after you tried to cook for them? No. One of the other lads brought home a human female who had gotten into a spot of trouble. Turned out, she ended up being a wonderful cook and a great housekeeper. She was kind, had a great voice, and did this really neat trick with her tongue. Achoo. We all grew quite fond of her, and were more than happy to change our septet to an octet. Tongue trick? Huh? What exactly are we talking about here? A trick is all. Forget I mentioned it. Achoo. Hey, Doc, don't get grumpy on us. I was just asking. Never thought you would be the bashful type. Achoo. <sighs> I'm sorry, Captain. Even though most of my memories of her are good, what happened at the end still brings me down. In the beginning, we took her in to get her away from a bad situation. After we managed to get it all straightened out, she ended up dumping us for some rich ponce who took credit for everything. I saw the glorious dawn tied up next to a mountain a half day's hike from here. He says he saw what he thinks is the glorious dawn anchored next to a mountain. It's about a half day's walk from here. What the hells are they doing over there? Hmm. Probably have something to do with the other ship moored next to it. Henry says the answer probably has something to do with the other airship at the mountain, next to the glorious dawn. Don't move, Professor! Whoa, hey, look, Captain. I know we've had our differences, but I think we can talk things through. Don't miss loss. What? I'm still alive. Good shot, Captain. <laughs> I never miss. What the hells is going on? Look behind you. Behind me? Ah! I have seen dogs smaller than that spider. Sorry we didn't say anything before, Gareth, but Henry and I know how you feel about spiders. I'm certain that if I told you that you had a giant, extremely poisonous spider on your shoulder, you would have screamed and run around in circles doing your version of the icky spider dance. I get why you and Henry didn't say anything, but why didn't Elizabeth? I've never told anyone on this ship that I'm terrified of spiders. I just wanted to see your expression as I pointed a gun at you. It's good to know you have a healthy fear of me. Let's keep it that way. Uh, 
looks like this ledge will put us about 10 feet from the side of the Glorious Dawn. From what I can see, the other airship is a dirigible with three cannons and four large cranes with nets mounted to the sides. Only one group uses nets like that in Trivia. I think you're probably right, Henry. Slavers. Let me see the spyglass. I can see four pirates on the deck of the Glorious Dawn. Each of them looks to be armed with a sword of some kind. If there are four on deck, it's a safe bet there are just as many below deck. I can also see a redskin man who I assume is Pilot, tied up next to the wheelhouse, with a burlap sack covering his head. What are we waiting for? Let's get to it. There's a pretty good gap between the glorious dawn and the ledge. We're going to have to jump for it. So? There's a gap? What are you implying? White dwarves can't jump? All I'm saying is it's going to be quite a jump for the professor and me. As to whether or not a dwarf could make that jump, uh... Let's just say that I've never seen a dwarvish hoopball player. I suppose if we have to, Henry could always toss you onto the ship. Damn it, Captain, I'm a doctor, not a projectile. Far below them on the deck of the Zeppelin, a cannonball at the base of a brass monkey came loose, causing the entire pyramid of steel balls to come crashing down. A drunken pirate wearing a red tunic had the poor look to choose that very moment to take a stroll under the moonlight. He stepped on the lead cannonball, pivoted 180 degrees, and fell backward onto the metal migration. When they reached the railing at the back of the ship, the momentum from the journey tossed the pirate over the edge. There's that strange feeling in my bones again. No matter. Let's do this. So, what are you planning on doing with your share of the money? <laughs> what the- Now, now, don't be getting up. Doctor's orders. <coughs> <coughs> oh, shit. Yes, I do believe it is. You're lucky. I was going to punch you in the face, but I won't now. I don't want to get shampoo on my hand. You call this lucky? Okay, maybe not. Hmm. Well, that's new. The rod's never turned into a six foot long staff before. It's okay. You can stop now, Henry. He's out cold. And you're making a mess on the deck with his blood. We should head below deck right away to find the others. We can leave Pilot here, since he's not in danger right now. You're right, for once, Professor. You and Trollness check the engine room and cargo hold. Henry and I will get the galley and the crew quarters. No sign of Izzy. Just some slaver pinning up nude pictures all over her engine room. <clears throat> uh -huh. Hopefully one of the others found something. I'll check on Trollus in the cargo hold first. Sheldon is still asleep in the bunk where they hibernate. Trollus' sleeping potion must really be working. They didn't even wake up when the ship was boarded. Speaking of Trollus, where is he? Watch where you're putting that hand, bucko. Unless you're willing to buy me breakfast afterwards. Look out, Trollus! You're about to roll into Sheldon's bunk! <gasps> me hand! It bit off me hand! I told you to watch where you put your hand. Ew! Spit it out! Spit it out! You don't know where that hand's been! Sheldon, the ship's been taken over by slavers! Meanwhile, in the galley... It's quite impressive to see how well you can tie up these slavers with just some cooking twine. I also think the pig nuts in their mouths to keep them quiet is a nice touch. Finish up here and catch up with me in my cabin. It's the only one of the crew quarters we haven't searched yet. Hmm. I'm probably going to be the first guy in there since the last captain. <laughs> nope. He beat me to it. 
believe that a slaver is dressed in my favorite corset and brushing his filthy hair with my hairbrush. I am pretty, oh so pretty, and witty, and something else that ends in itty. How about shitty? No, that doesn't fit the theme of the song at all. Oh, bugger. You present quite the problem. Normally, I would either shoot or stab anyone going through my stuff without permission. If I run you through with my sword, I'll ruin my favorite corset. Same thing with shooting you. Nice throw with that potato, Henry. Come, Spock, he is a flinging poo. Now help me get him out of my clothes. <laughs> you know, as an omnisexual dwarf, I thought I had seen just about every kinky thing under the twin moons. Turns out I was wrong. I can now add seeing a chim and a woman with a mechanical arm stripping a slaver out of women's lingerie to the list. Did, Did you, you find, find Izzy? Izzy? No, she wasn't in the engine room or the cargo hold. No sign of Tish either. That has to be the slaver's airship. Come on, we need to see what's going on and untie Pilot. I'll check on Pilot. Throw your weapons overboard and prepare to be boarded. Or else I toss your pretty little engineer over the side. There you go, lad. Are you all right? I am uncertain, Short Doctor. Perhaps you can help me determine if I am hallucinating or not. Is purple magic crawling all over the angry-looking professor's black staff? What? Well, I'll be damned to non-alcoholic beverages. It sure looks like that's what's happening. Wait, Gareth, what are you doing? Get down from the railing. You'll never survive a fall to the deck of the slaver airship from this far above it. Gareth, no, don't, Gareth! This has been Gareth and the Lost Island, Episode 7, starring Peter McGiffin as the narrator and Henry's translator, Alan Petty as Trownis Granite Staff, Patrick Mallard as Gareth Mintel, Deborah Mallard as Izzy Morgana, Lauren Kong as Elizabeth Morgana, Daniel Four as Sheldon's left eye stalk. Casey Swan as pilot, and Lauren Sterling Knott as the slaver captain. Featuring OJVA, Peter McGiffin, and Patrick Mallard as slavers. No giant spiders were harmed during the recording of the show, mainly because they scare us silly, and it's hard to get any work done while doing the icky spider dance. Gareth and the Lost Island was written and directed by Patrick Mallard.